there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth to stress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. One man, one microphone, one mission, one message. True News, the only newscast reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And now for the most powerful hour on radio, here is End Time Newsman, Rick Wiles. This is True News, the news program that reports the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help us God. I'm Rick Wiles. Welcome to one hour of uncensored news, views, and commentary. Pastor J.A. White will be my guest today. He and I will talk about the gospel of our grandfathers. I know you're going to be blessed by this interview. First, the top news headlines from True News. A major NATO war exercise is underway in Poland, Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania this week. All four nations border Russia. Steadfast Jazz 2013 involves over 6,000 troops from all NATO member states, plus NATO partners, Finland, Sweden, and Ukraine. Steadfast Jazz started last Saturday and will end this Saturday. The war drill scenario is a NATO response to an invasion of Poland by an unnamed foreign power. You can fill in the blank. Last July, Russian officials expressed outrage over news that NATO would conduct a major war drill on its border. In May 2012, Russian General Nikolai Makarov, senior military commander of the Russian army, warned NATO against further Western military encroachment on Russia's border with Poland. He said in 2012, a decision to use destructive military force preemptively against NATO member states would be made if the situation worsened. He alluded to striking with tactical nuclear weapons those NATO military bases hosting the U.S. anti-missile defense system. Russian President Putin responded this week, by canceling a 2011 Kremlin order to cooperate with NATO on missile defense issues. Last week, two Russian Tu-160 Blackjack strategic nuclear bombers flew from Russia over the Caribbean Sea and made stops in Venezuela and Nicaragua. Furthermore, China sent a spy ship within close proximity of Hawaii last week. And last week, Chinese news media published maps showing the American cities that will be destroyed in a war with China. China's Global Times estimated 12 million Americans on the West Coast would die. A new round of diplomatic talks started today in Geneva between Iran and six world powers, the United States, Russia, China, Britain, France, and Germany. European and Middle Eastern news outlets have reported for days that world leaders will offer Iran a lucrative cash incentive to halt its nuclear program for six months. A more comprehensive agreement would be hammered out during that six-month period. As expected, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu said in Jerusalem today that Israel totally rejects the proposal being discussed in Geneva. He said compromising with Iran will be a historical mistake. Mr. Netanyahu said the compromise will merely give Iran more time to continue developing its nuclear program. Former U.N. Ambassador John Bolton told radio host Aaron Klein that time is running out for Israel to stop Iran. Some former Israeli officials have speculated that Israel will have to attack Iran by early 2014. The Iranian deal is making Saudi Arabia very nervous. The Sunni nation fears that a nuclear-armed Shiite Iran will tip the balance of power in the Middle East in favor of Tehran. BBC reported today that Saudi Arabia has an agreement with Pakistan to acquire Pakistani nuclear warheads. The BBC said the Saudi government provided generous financial support to the development of Pakistan's nuclear weapons program with the understanding 
that nuclear weapons would be supplied to Saudi Arabia if and when needed to counter a nuclear-armed Iran. Russian President Vladimir Putin will visit Egypt later this month. He's moving in to take advantage of the mess Mr. O has made in Egypt and Saudi Arabia. Egypt wants Russian fighter jets and weapons. Russia wants an Egyptian port for their warships. The U.S. Senate is expected to pass tonight the Employment Non-Discrimination Act known as INDA. The bill would outlaw workplace discrimination against homosexuals, lesbians, bisexuals, and transgendered persons. If it passes the Senate and passes the House and signed by Mr. O., Employers would not be permitted to prohibit cross-dressing in the workplace. Churches are exempted from the law, but many religious organizations would be compelled to obey the law. For example, Christian radio stations and Christian bookstores not directly owned by a church would not be exempt from INDA. All 55 Senate Democrats, including the senators from the Deep South, are expected to vote for the gay rights bill tonight. A number of Republicans, such as Susan Collins, are expected to join with the Democrats. Arizona Senator John McCain indicated yesterday that he is leaning toward voting for INDA. During the debate, not one senator, not one senator, spoke against the gay rights legislation. Lobbyists for big corporations are pushing for passage of INDA. Dow Chemical, Marriott Hotels, Procter & Gamble, and others have endorsed the bill. Homosexual activists are counting on big business to pressure House Republicans and Speaker John Boehner to support the bill. By the way, a Pew Research survey last June said Americans now favor acceptance of homosexuality in the society by a margin of 60% to 31%. Researchers led by the Russian Academy of Sciences published their investigation this week into the massive asteroid that exploded over the Russian city Chelyabinsk last February. They said the asteroid was a warning to the Earth. When the asteroid exploded over Chelyabinsk on February 5th, the blast injured over 1,200 people and destroyed or damaged hundreds of buildings. Russian scientists have spent the last nine months, combing through the surrounding area and villages to assess the damage it caused. They talked to eyewitnesses and examined video footage of the fireball as it streaked across the sky. Damage was spread across 55 miles from the point of impact. Shockwaves shattered windows in 3,600 apartment buildings and collapsed a factory roof. The asteroid glowed 30 times brighter than the sun at a mere altitude of 18 miles above the ground. The brilliant glow burned the retinas of one person who made the mistake of looking directly at it. The victim lost skin due to radiation burns. Traveling at a speed of 40,000 miles per hour, the asteroid's airburst had the force of up to 600,000 tons of TNT. The Russian researchers said the threat of another direct strike by an asteroid is much higher than previously thought. Their research of space rocks striking the ground and other regions indicates it happens with surprising frequency. Most are undetected because they explode over the ocean or in remote, unpopulated areas. The report warns that there could be many more space rocks, similar to the one that hit Chelyabinsk, on a collision course with our planet. The scientists concluded that the Earth is vulnerable to a major hit by an asteroid. A massive fireball streaked across the nighttime skies over Southern California Wednesday night. The fireball was so brilliant that motorists hit their brakes and swerved on highways as drivers attempted to slow down to observe its entry into the atmosphere. People in Utah, Arizona, and Nevada saw it too. A video in Los Angeles shows a massive white ball plunging toward the earth and giving off two large flashes of brilliant light equal the size of the moon. Another light was shining on Tuesday, but it wasn't a meteorite. It was a Hindu Diwali light lit in the White House by 
none other than the first lady of voodoo, Michelle Obama. Michelle's mama, Marion Robinson, lives in the White House. It was reported in 2009 that she was sacrificing chickens in the White House by practicing Haitian Santeria rituals, otherwise known as voodoo. First Lady Michelle and Mr. O himself participated in the Hindu festival of Diwali. On Tuesday, Mrs. Obama said that she and Mr. O want to celebrate all religious faiths. She reminded the Hindus gathered in the White House that she and Barack have celebrated Diwali every year since entering the White House. Diwali is the Hindu festival that invites the goddess of prosperity to enter a house. Mr. O carries a monkey god idol in his pocket. And you can all see what that has done for the American economy. And Prince Charles and his wife, the Duchess of Cornbread, attended a sacred Hindu festival on the banks of an Indian river on the first day of their nine-day tour of India. The royals were welcomed by Hindu guru to join in the ritual in the city of Rishikish, where the Beatles studied transcendental meditation in 1968. Time to take a short break. Pastor J.A. White will join me when I return to talk about the gospel of our grandfather. This is True News, the End Time Newscast. Reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. You're listening to True News, the End Time Newscast. Baptism is for believers only, and Dr. Stanley says that goes for both children and adults. Here's today's Moment with Charles Stanley. Salvation is for those who understand that they're sinners, separated from God, need God, need the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. So I want to say this lovingly. If you raise a child and you have them baptized, sprinkled, poured on, or whatever you do, and you tell them that they are spiritually safe, that they're going to heaven because they have been anointed or sprinkled on, you have misled them. You have done them a great disservice. I have met people all through these years who really and truly believe that they were saved because their parents had them baptized as babies. Baptizing a baby, listen, puts water on the baby's head. It does nothing for the baby's spirit or their soul. And you cannot be baptized in the behalf of that child. And listen, you may love that child want that child to be godly, raise them to be godly. As you know how, they need to get baptized scripturally following salvation. You're listening to True News, the End Time Newscast. I'm Rick Wiles. A major worldwide Christian denomination may split apart over the issue of homosexuality. What is known as the Pilling Report will be submitted next month to the Anglican House of Bishops. Rumors flying around the Anglican Communion say the report will propose that the Church of England introduce a new liturgy in its worship services that will bless homosexual marriages. Leading traditional Anglicans have notified the Archbishop of Canterbury that the introduction of same-sex marriage rights in the Anglican Communion will split the worldwide communion into pieces. Bishop Michael Nazir Ali, who was a guest on True News earlier this year, said gay marriage is the red line as far as he and other bishops are concerned. He said traditional Anglicans will be forced to reject the authority of all bishops who support gay marriage. 331 traditional Anglican bishops from 40 nations met in Nairobi, Kenya, last week to hammer out a statement and strategy to deal with the growing apostasy in the Anglican Church. The statement said, quote, We want to make clear that any civil partnership of a sexual nature does not receive the blessing of God, end of quote. Nigerian Anglican Bishop Emmanuel Chukwuma warned that if American and European Anglicans continue to push for gay rights, the Anglican communion will disintegrate. Bishop Chukwuma 
is the chairman of the Christian Association of Nigeria. He and other African bishops vowed to sever their ecclesiastical ties to apostate Anglican churches in America and England. Citing the book of Ephesians, the African bishop said he cannot have fellowship with church leaders who do not practice what the Bible teaches as truth. Bishop Chukwuma said the Anglican churches of Africa will not compromise the Word of God, and they are prepared to go their own way if America and Great Britain slide into rebellion against God. Former Australian Anglican Bishop Peter Jensen strongly denounced the movement in churches to endorse gay marriage. He said, however, that the Nairobi Conference was not a breakaway convention, but instead should be seen as a unity movement of traditional Anglicans who will not back down on the authority of the Word of God. He said the intention is to gather up the remnant of the Anglican communion. He said true Anglicans need to stand for biblical truth, and it will cost them dearly to be obedient to God. My friends, I want you to know that it it is vital for you and me to know and understand that the battle for biblical purity is being waged worldwide. And there is a remnant of God in all the Christian denominations. Men and women of faith are on the front lines refusing to compromise, refusing to sell out, taking a stand for truth. And each of us have our own part in this battle. And I I want to encourage everybody to pray for your fellow remnant Christian brothers and sisters throughout the world who are fighting the good fight of faith. And one of our True News listeners recently suggested a book to me, and I'm so glad that person did send that suggestion. It is titled, The Gospel of Our Grandfathers, Preserving the Good News for Future Generations. I know I mention a lot of books on this program, and and I certainly understand you can't possibly read all of them. I have to read them, but that's my job, and it keeps me busy. This book, however, is one that I heartily recommend. For devout Christians, it's a short refresher course in the key tenets of the Christian faith. For new Christians or or people who are exploring Christianity, it's a simple, easy-to-understand explanation of the most important beliefs in Christianity. Again, the title is The Gospel of Our Grandfathers. The author is Pastor J.A. White. He serves in the Family Ministries at Annandale Evangelical Free Church in Annandale, Minnesota. We have a lot of listeners in Minnesota, so if you're interested in knowing more about the church, the website is annandellfree.com, and uh, Annandale is uh, northwest of the city of Minneapolis. Uh, Pastor Aaron White, welcome to True News. Thank you, brother, for having me. It's an honor to be here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, as you know, as I was introducing you, and I was telling uh, our audience about uh, the battle that's going on inside the Anglican Church, you know, it's a major event that happened last week in Kenya. 331 bishops came together to draw a red line saying, we will not accept homosexual marriages in the church, and we're prepared to to walk out. We're prepared to go our own way. Uh, this battle, whether it's whether it's about homosexuality or, or any other issue, there's a battle going on worldwide for the purity of the gospel. And, and, and that's why I'm so glad you wrote this book, because it's, it's, a, it's a very simple, easy book to, to read and understand. It's, what is it, about 150 pages? And uh, what, what I really like about it, Pastor, is that uh, you've taken very deep, theological topics, and you've written them in a very simplistic, easy-to-understand manner. And that's that's not an easy feat. Uh, <laughs> if, if people have never written anything, to take a complicated, deep issue and simplify it and and bring it down to just a few pages, that is that takes a lot of skill. And uh, so the Lord's blessed you in this. I, I, really, I really enjoyed the book. Well, that's... Thank you so much. It's humbling to even hear you say that. Um, it was, I guess, a lot of um, the book really was was written primarily for my children. Um, I really didn't intend for a book to to go out on a larger audience. It, it began as an idea in my head uh, that I, I have four children, all under the age of eight years old, mm-hmm. and I, I preach the gospel <laughs> all the time in my church and in the community. 
Um, and, and of course, at my, my home worship and family worship with my children, I'm, I'm just taking the advice of, of older saints, and I'm preaching law and gospel to my children and, and trying to show them Christ in every line and every word and every sentence. Uh, I read a lot of the Puritans, and so that kind of leaks out. You know, I see mm-hmm. Jesus everywhere. What does, uh, that mean? I, what, what does that mean when you say you, you preach law and gospel? Well, and that's something that this the book I really wanted to drive as well is law and gospel. I, I'm looking at my book collection right now, and most of these men are, are passed away, some of them many, many years ago. But all of them, uh, whether it be Martin Lloyd-Jones or Edwards or Spurgeon or Luther or on and on and on, um, what I find is that they, they did not despise the law of God. Uh, the law was a, a taskmaster to drive them to Christ, to drive us to Christ. And I've, in my own generation, have seen a, a woeful abandonment of the law and gospel preaching. Um, I want my children to understand what the law is, that, that we are not to despise the law, that the law is perfect, the law is good, but the law does not save. But it drives them to Christ. Uh, I was just talking to a lady a couple of weeks ago. It was a completely just providential uh, interaction. I was out cleaning up my driveway, and she was dropping off some things for my wife, and um, we began to talk, and within about 10 minutes, she was sharing about how she grew up in a very religious background, but had walked away, Um, (laughs) and I was just trying not to smile too big, but her words to me verbatim were, in the school that I went to as a child, I had a little green placard in my folder with the Ten Commandments on, and I remember as a little girl, all I could think of is, I can't obey these, I'll never be able to obey these. And I said, well, that's the way it's designed. I go, the law will not save you, but it drives you to what you need. The law drives you to the gospel. Has anyone ever explained what Christ did and why he did it uh, and why that's good news? And she said, not, not really. And so we spent the next 15, 20 minutes just unpacking basically in short order everything that's in this book, who God is, the fallenness of man, the work of Christ, and, and not in a four spiritual laws kind of way. We were laboring in the Word, and I, I gave her a copy of my book. And I've been praying for her since that conversation um, and letting the Holy Spirit save her. If you don't know the law, you, you don't know you need a Savior to deliver you from the penalties of breaking the law. Well, the Puritan said, when sin is bitter, the cross is sweet. And I grew up in church. I I grew up in church. I was a nice, moral church kid and uh, completely unregenerate. And and that's that's really the driving passion in my parenting and my my preaching. I just preached at um, one of the universities here, one of our state universities, a couple weeks ago at Campus Crusade. And, And I told them my testimony. I said, many of you here believe... That you're that you're saved, and when in fact you do not know God, because no one's ever explained to you who God is and why the cross is such good news. And then we had a wonderful night that night. I talked to a lot of young men afterward, uh, and and it's the same message I've been preaching for the last four years, and that is tell them the attributes of God, tell them who God is, tell them why the cross is so sweet, and let them feel the weight of their sin. Whatever happened to that? I, I needed to be broken under the law. Uh, before the cross was good news to me, and that didn't happen until I was 22. That's right. I, you know, none of us, none of us want to judge people, um, but you can tell often when you're talking to quote church people that they're not Christians; they're church people. Uh, they 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 belong to churchianity, but they're not a disciple of Jesus Christ. You can just hear their words; they have no no comprehension of of sin. They have no comprehension of what Jesus did on the cross. They have no comprehension of why he went to the cross. And uh, they're part of some feel-good movement that uses the name of Jesus. And uh, and this is very prevalent now throughout the United States and many Western nations. You have, you have churches filled with people who are not saved. Absolutely. And in a way, brother, I know that that's, that's always been there. I know some, mm-hmm. I've had this conversation with so many people and other pastors, and uh, there's almost a kind of a fatalism when they always go to the wheat and the tares, where, well, it's, it's always going to be that way. Mm-hmm. And I look at that and I say, if, if you can sleep at night with that, then so be it. But I want a pure church. Uh, I know we won't be completely pure until, until the other side of glory, so I'm not naive in that regard. But, 
But I know when you lift up Christ in every sermon and, and you drive the Word of God to the hearts of your people, if you uh, had it Spurgeon say it, uh, I loaded myself into the gospel cannon and I fired myself at the people. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you do that um, properly and humbly but passionately, Romans one sixteen, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. And, and I've seen the Lord honor that time and again. I, uh, <laughs> we were in between youth pastors here at my church, and uh, I was asked by the elder board if I could kind of be the interim youth pastor, and um, was there for nine months along with my other duties and um, a lot of prayer. And I said, Lord, I'm just going to preach the gospel. I'm, I'm just going to preach the gospel, and I pray that you would move. And these are the same kids that we've had for years. I mean, uh, we're not a real big church here north of the cities, but long story short, Brother, for nine months, I started with the attributes of God, and I just preached every week, all the way through basically everything that's in the book, the Gospel of Our Grandfathers. And uh, by God's grace, we, we baptized six of our youth, um, and I believe all the ones we baptized are bearing fruit. They're, some of them are engaged with, with godly partners. Some of them are um, attending ministries on campus, and, and they're living it out. Mm-hmm. And, and that's all glory to God, because he, he works through the preaching of the gospel. And uh, so I'm a firm believer <laughs> in, in every regard. I, um, I, I'm uh, my, my, my personal makeup. I, I'm, I'm a binge learner. I, I go on binges, and I, I, I get immersed in a topic, and I start reading and reading and reading and studying. And, and then I move on to something else, and... and that's just it's just me. It's my makeup. I, I but right now my my binge is is Martin Luther, and and so I've been I've been reading every night for the last several weeks. I've been reading things written by Martin Luther, and I'm I'm rediscovering you know the Reformation. I'm I'm rediscovering who who Luther was and what he believed and why he had such an impact uh, on the world uh, 500 years ago. But he taught, he taught law and the gospel. It was very Absolutely. much part of Lutherism. Absolutely, he did. Uh, Luther, he, he loved the law. Uh, one of my favorite quotes from, from Luther is, The word of God is not my friend, for it cuts off my flesh at every place my sin wants to go. Uh, Luther knew the power of the word. And, uh, and actually, this past Halloween, I've, I've reclaimed that day, and I, we homeschool our children, so I, I taught a lesson on the Reformation, and we made little... Reformation Day cupcakes. <laughs> we have a lot of spare time here in Minnesota. Mm-hmm. We put little hammers on top of them made out of pretzels and things. And I'm, I'm trying to teach my children why the Reformation is important. Not, not to exalt men, uh, but the Lord used those men uh, like John Huss and John Knox and Luther and, and on and on and on to preserve the gospel. And that's what I want to do in this book is preserve the true gospel uh, the gospel that Luther preached is Christ alone, grace alone, Scripture alone, faith alone, to God be the glory alone. It's not a, a man-centered gospel of selfism or self-esteem. And the last thing I need is self-esteem. I don't need any more people to, to tell me I'm awesome, because my sin already wants to believe that. What I need is someone to come and point their finger at me, like Nathan did to David, and say, you are the man. And I need to be driven to my knees, and I want my children to hear that gospel, not because I'm malicious, but because that is the gospel that saves. And I'm willing to let the, the Holy Spirit break them in order that they might find eternal life. Uh, and so we've got to learn to get out of the way. We've got about 20-some uh, minutes here. Let's, uh, let's uh, just, I know we're not going to cover the entire book, um, but, but let's, uh, let's start at, at the beginning, uh, part one, Behold Your God, Knowing the God of Scripture. Your chapter one is uh, the God in need of nothing. What can you what can you tell us about this? Well, I I had this the the framework for the book in my mind as I was kind of wrapping up seminary, and um, and again I want I was preserving this book in my mind, picturing my children being about twenty twenty five years old, maybe fifteen, I don't know. And my idea was I'm going to print this book, I'm going to I'm going to write a note to them, and I'm going to put away in a drawer. Uh, but the Lord kept opening doors and opening doors, and uh, here I am speaking to you, which I really appreciate. Um, and so it, I wanted, I was thinking very hard, very critically about what was the first chapter going to say to my children? What was the first chapter going to say to the people in my church that are going to read this? 
uh, because we're starting off with the attributes of God. And I thought, you know, in this day and age, especially in America, as I kind of hinted at before, it's such a self-centered age. And my generation is is rife with narcissism. And, And short of the grace of God, I'd be no different. And I fight it every day. But that's what I said in this first chapter, is the self-existence of God. He, he does not need our worship. Our worship does not add anything to him. He is, there is perfect communion and, and fellowship in the Trinity from eternity past. And yet in his sovereign mercy and good uh, goodwill, he created us and, and, and actually takes pleasure in our worship, and even though uh, we're not adding anything to his his being by worshiping. And just to, to set the stage, that who is this God that we worship? Um, and just to, to hopefully knock out the props underneath some of these idols that we set up in our hearts, which most of them look like us. And that's Psalm 50, verse, I believe, 21, that God says that I remain silent, and you thought that I was altogether like you. And uh, so I want to see, I want my readers to see that God is self-existent, that he is self-contained, uh, that he does not need us, and yet uh, in his mercy he has created us. And I just felt that was proper. I'm always um, amazed at how many how many Christians don't know who Jesus is, and they don't know anything about his existence prior to his birth on earth. It's like they think um, he was a he, he was you know the first time he was alive was was when he came out of the womb of Mary. And right, they have no awareness that he he's always existed. I have my Bible here in front of me, Colossians one fifteen. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Verse seventeen, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And I'm actually reading a book right now that just came out by David Murray called Jesus on Every Page, um, and it's seeing Christ in the Old Testament. And when you look at this passage in Colossians, I'll actually be preaching a sermon on this in mid-December. He's the image of the invisible God. All things are made by him, through him, and for him, Jesus. And when you, when you think about that, you go back to Genesis and you read creation, and from there on, Jesus is everywhere. If you read Exodus 17, uh, when the people are grumbling, give us water. Did you bring us out here to let us perish? And it says that Moses went to the Lord and inquired... And he says, why do you take up a case against me and against God? They were calling God out, saying, you're not faithful. You're not going to do what you promised to do. They deserve punishment right there, all of them. And yet the Lord said to Moses, go and stand before the people. I will go before you and stand on the rock, strike the rock. And then, of course, we know water came out and and satisfied the people who, who deserved only punishment. And it says, I will go before you and stand on the rock. And so we have a beautiful picture of the gospel where the Lord is standing there, receiving the punishment, giving grace. And yet you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, regarding that passage in Exodus, he says, and they all drank from the rock, and the rock was Christ. So we see the gospel all throughout the Old Testament, if you have eyes to see. And... It's just beautiful, beautiful. But I see the same thing uh, when, yes. I, when I counsel with many people. Is mm-hmm. Go back to the Old Testament and, and see Jesus and, and enjoy Jesus in the Old Testament. He's sovereign over all of it. Um, I had a couple of Jehovah's Witnesses come to my door a couple of days ago, which is funny because I live in the parsonage. <laughs> so it always amazes me when they... When well, they're they they're either the brave or not very aware. Well, <laughs> well my first words, I said, you, can't, you know where I'm at. Theologically, right? And they said, well, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, and I said, well, l- let me tell you something. You, you ever heard of Arianism, that Jesus was a created being? And No, no. I said, well, it, it was a heresy of around the 4th century, and it's just been held as a heresy ever since. Just something to think about. I said, you know, Jesus is not a created being. Uh, go back to these passages. And we had, a, we had a good conversation, and they left. But it just breaks my heart. Mm-hmm. Said, Lord, please, open their eyes. Help them to, to see and savor you on every single page and to see you for who you are. Uh, you're, you're sovereign over creation. You were there in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word. Word's with God. The Word was God. So I, I totally agree with you. And, yes. and it's a wonderful yeah. exercise to do in discipleship to take 
someone that you're discipling or pouring into, namely your children, and take them back to the Old Testament and show them Jesus. And, uh, and it's a blessing. I like I liked to imagine what the scene looked like in heaven before Jesus Christ was in Mary's womb and the Father saying, one of us must go down there. One of us must become a human. Mm. And I imagine Jesus saying, send me. Let me go. <laughs> and and can you imagine, Pastor, can you imagine the, the scene in heaven around the throne? And there stands Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, in all his royal splendor. And suddenly, you know, the Father says, go. And suddenly, he disappears. And his his robe, his crown, is on the floor. And Jesus is gone. And suddenly, on this little planet Earth, in the womb of a of a woman made of dirt inside her womb is Jesus Christ and he's in there this tiny tiny little being inside the womb of a human that he made mm-hmm. I, that thought blows me away <laughs> that's why the word says angels long to look into these things but I if know. they can't figure it out we'll never figure it out I know and you know here's the other thing people need to understand that If it were possible at that time to touch that embryo, Jesus Christ, and you had disease, you would have been healed because he was all God as an embryo. It wasn't that he grew up and suddenly got godlike powers. He wasn't Superman. He was God in the womb of Mary. Amen. And and he the power, the heal was there then. The power to deliver. He didn't, you know, these powers didn't come upon him. He was always God. Always God in human flesh to save mankind. Why is it so important for people to understand that God came to earth in human flesh? I have a chapter on that in my book uh, because that is such an overlooked thing, and yet it's so crucial. I tell my children, I said, you know, Jesus died for you. Yep. I said, you know, he also lived for you. And I I get a lot of puzzled looks because my children are small. I said, you know, someone had to fulfill the law. Because it says if you break the law, you're accountable for all of it. And and we know because we were born of Adam that we have sin in us. It's not just what we do, it's who we are. Read Ephesians 2. Because we're by nature children of wrath. Psalm 51, I was brought forth in iniquity. And, of course, we see that lived out if you have little ones at home. I mean, you don't have to teach them to sin. It's there. And yet, I want my children to understand, and I want my readers to understand in this book, I want my church to understand that he didn't just die for you. Let's not boil the cross down to something simple. It's not. It's simple. Our salvation is so difficult, God had to do it. And he didn't just die for you. He lived for you. He fulfilled the law of God. What Adam failed to do, Christ completed Adam failed to keep the law. Adam failed um, in every regard, but Christ succeeded in every regard. And the Word also says that it must be of like kind. If man has sinned, man must die. And so could he have come as a 33-year-old man and just died on the cross if that was all that was needed? Of course he could. He's God. But man has sinned, man must die. And so Christ lived fully God, fully man, Admittedly, that, that's a mind-blowing thought, and it has produced all kinds of heresies as, as fallible men have tried to sit down and dissect uh, the, the hypostatic union of Christ, the, the, the fully God and fully manness of Christ. But this is what Scripture affirms. And he lived a perfect life, satisfied the law of God, and was able then to shed his blood on behalf of sinners. And his blood was efficacious, it was effective, it was pleasing to the Lord. And uh, a lot of a lot of churches teach that God did away with the Ten Commandments. Is that true? <laughs> well, well, Jesus certainly didn't. Um, 
God has not done away with the Ten Commandments. There's a lot of good things online by, by a lot of good pastors that are a lot smarter than I am, blogs and videos and things about the place of the law in the life of the Christian. Um, guys like John Piper, I know, has, has written some blogs and videos about that, and John MacArthur. And, um, but in short, uh, no, God did, or Jesus did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And yet we live as if he never gave us a law to obey. Uh, we are we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone. We'll never be able to keep the law, and yet the law um, is a means to drive us to Christ. The law is sweet to me because it, it constantly drives me to Christ, and it, it tells me how I should live. So the law is not something to be shirked or abandoned. The law is sweet, and if you're not preaching law and gospel, you're you're missing you're missing fifty percent. <laughs> Of the equation, and especially because we have so many unregenerate people in our congregations on, on any given day, you must preach the law and the gospel. Uh, you must labor in that, especially if you're doing evangelism. Um, I see a lot of evangelism that focuses primarily on grace. Um, I need the law, like I said in my own testimony, I needed the law to come and break me. And I, even as a saved man who loves the Lord and who is sensitive to sin and uh, all of those things, I, I need the law as a taskmaster to drive me to Christ, because uh, if there is no law, my, my sinful heart, there's enough sin in me that will take my eyes off of Christ and want to put them on myself. And so I've come to be grateful for the law, uh, because Hebrews 12 says that he chastises those whom he loves. If you do not come under the discipline of God, you are not a son. And the law is his tool that, that brings conviction in my heart that drives me to Christ. I, I see the, the, the commandments, the Ten Commandments, as separate, different from the Jewish law. And, you know, no one's going to be able to keep the massive amount of, of law that the Jews were, were compelled to, uh, to, to keep. But the, law, the commandments, the commandments did not first come to man by, uh, through the hands of, of Moses. I think Moses was the first one to write it down. I think I got. I think I think what God said to Moses was, "Look, I'm going to I'm going to say this one more time, and we're, we're going to write this down. I want you to take this down and show it to." Him. <laughs> and the reason I say this, Aaron, is because Abraham lived what roughly 400 years before Moses, and the Bible says Abraham kept the commandments. Well, how did Abraham keep the commandments? If the commandments didn't come to mankind until Moses. So that tells me mankind knew the commandments. The commandments have always existed. And Abraham kept the commandments. The law came later. But the commandments have always existed. And and Paul said they were put in our hearts. And nobody nobody can say, I didn't know that was wrong to do. Oh, brother, that that was my testimony. Uh, I was going to a secular university, the very same one that I preached at a couple of weeks ago, actually. Uh, it's a state university here, and I, long story short, was in a philosophy class, uh, an upper-level philosophy class in the fine arts department. And you can probably imagine what was <laughs> what was being taught and what wasn't being taught. But there I sat... And the whole class, it was, it was very interesting. The whole class, there was no quizzes, no tests. Your entire grade rested on one paper. And that was at the very end of the semester. And so every class hour was an open discussion. And, again, I don't want to go into too much detail, take up too much time, but long story short, the whole thrust of the class was what defines right or wrong? How do we know what is right and what is wrong? And, of course, you have utilitarianism, which says whatever's for the greater good defines right or wrong, and uh, relativism, which is essentially <laughs> what we live in today, uh, which okay is what's okay for you is okay for you, and okay for me is okay for me. And, but I found myself sitting there, I think third to the last row, unsaved, but thinking I was saved, completely not living for the Lord, but I found myself heatedly arguing for objective morality. I remember raising my hand and just, just pushing for this, this point of view that says, no, there is objective morals. They're written on our heart. We know what's right and what's wrong. I don't need a, a handbook to know that some things are evil. I don't, I don't, Darwinianism cannot help me with issues of morality in terms of, of evil. And 
the Lord just used that class and that time to just open my eyes and break my heart because I realized what a hypocrite I was. Because here I am arguing for objective morality, and as Romans, the book of Romans says, God's law is written on our heart, no man has an excuse for, for the Lord. And yet, I'd go home and live as a relativist. And it was during that time that I was born again. What does it mean to be born again? Jesus in John 3, speaking to Nicodemus, John 3, 3 says, you must be born again, or you will not see the kingdom of God. I was trying to explain this to my daughter a few days ago, and, and she said exactly what Nicodemus said. You have to get in mom's tummy again? And she kind of laughed. I said, no, that's what Nicodemus said, too. Uh, but Jesus said, you must be born again. And he says that those who are born of the Spirit, it's like the wind. It blows where it wills. You hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it comes from. To be born again is when you're dead. You're spiritually dead. And Romans ten seventeen says, says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. When someone preaches to you or the, the word of God comes to you and you hear the truth about Christ and who he is, God's spirit makes you alive and gives you eyes to see and ears to hear. And you see how beautiful he is and what he's done for us and what price was paid for us. And you, in a sense, do what I did. I hit my knees in my, my college room and I said, Lord, I, I deserve hell. Thank you, Jesus. And he, he causes you to be born again. Second Corinthians 5.17 says, You are a new creation. If anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And that's not poetry. That is a literal uh, changing of the guard in your heart. And, and it's a, a real thing. It's not just something that happens in heaven's courtroom. Being born again is hearing the word of God. Having a, being given a heart of flesh that beats for God and a heart that desires to obey God, a heart that can say uh, what John says in 1 John 5, 3, that uh, this is the love of God to obey his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. And only until the Holy Spirit comes into you and indwells you and opens your eyes and your ears and gives you a heart that beats for God, his commands are very burdensome unless he moves upon you in that way. And then that's what I've been praying for my children. That's what I pray that those who read my book, uh, by God's grace, will experience that. But it is certainly not just raising your hand at a conference or writing a date in your Bible or having a pastor tell you that you're saved or born again or any of those things. There has to be an awareness that you are a sinner and you're destined to eternal hell. And Absolutely. if you don't, if you don't have that awareness, then you're. You're not. How can you repent? And if you don't repent, why would you call upon Jesus to be your Savior? So there has to be that moment when a person realizes that he or she is a sinner, that he or she has been breaking the commandments of God, and there is no escape other than to accept the salvation offered by God. Absolutely. That's what it was for me. I... I grew up in the church, but it wasn't until that day. Uh, and I had been reading the Word again. My grandfather had given me a, a study Bible. And it wasn't until that day, and, and the Lord was working in my heart and opening my eyes and, and all of those things internally. But from my vantage point, all I knew is that I was falling apart. Because I had never, I had never really felt in my heart, had never owned what Scripture said about me. Scripture told me very clearly that you're dead, Ephesians 2, you're dead in your transgressions. Uh, Romans 5 says we're enemies of God. Uh, we're wicked men. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? None of those things ever seem to apply to me. I was a nice church kid. I'd hold the door for you. I'd smile. I'd, I'd say grace before a meal, maybe. I mean, I wouldn't say the name of Jesus too loud at a restaurant because I don't want to be too fanatical, you know, but... But I do nice things, and so I, none of those ever penetrated me until this day when God graciously touched my heart, opened my eyes, and, and I owned it. And I said, Lord, like they did in Acts chapter 2, they were cut to the heart, and they said, Brothers, what shall we do to be saved? We're, we're undone. It's, it's Isaiah, and in Isaiah chapter 6, when he sees the glory of the Lord, he says, Woe is me. <laughs> I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the people of unclean lips. And until a man is brought to that place. And yet there are people, uh, we have some in our church, uh, wonderful, godly people. 
uh, that seem to have been born again at a, at a young age, you know, maybe, I don't know, five or six or whatever mm-hmm. the case may be. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and bless their hearts, the, some, I've had to counsel with a few of them because they say, I don't, I don't have a cool testimony. Yeah. I don't have a cool testimony like you. And I love the words of J.C. Ryle. I quoted him in my book a few times. I, I said, hey, J.C. Ryle said that some do have this huge moment when they know they're born again, that the, the law of God comes and crushes them, and the cross of Christ is sweet to save them, and, and they know. But many people, if they grow up in a Christian home especially, says that their winter turns to spring without them even knowing. And living in Minnesota, winter turning to spring is very vivid for me. And there are some people that have heard the gospel preached in their homes, had godly fathers, good churches, and God has graciously worked on them to where they don't have a cool testimony. They're just they're godly people that have great assurance of salvation, and they have for a long time. And that's a blessed thing, and that, that's what I'm praying for my children. I said, Lord, save them early. I, I don't want cool testimonies. Pastor, I, I want fruit. I, I've, yeah, amen, fruit. i got uh, enough time for, I think, one more question. W- what do you... Last night, as I was uh, going to sleep, I was reading Luther's uh, catechism on um, baptism. W- what do you believe about baptism? Well, it's funny you bring that up. I just got off the phone with a young man who wants to be baptized. <laughs> and uh, he, he, uh, he's doing his homework as well. And he said, I see the word baptizo. It, it means to be immersed, doesn't it? It means to go under the water. I said, yeah, yeah, that's, that's what the word scripturally means, is to go under the water. He says, okay. Um, he says, well, I want to I be baptized. I want to be obedient to the word. I said, well, praise God. It's getting a little cold outside, so we can't go to the lake like I normally do, but we'll, we'll figure something out. <laughs> but baptism to me, um, and he was asking the same thing I think a lot of people ask. They say, well, does baptism save you? I say, well, no, no, we're saved by grace alone through faith alone. However... We don't want to also let the pendulum swing the other way and act as if baptism is optional or not a big deal. The Christ commands us in Matthew 28, if you're making disciples, part of making disciples is baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What did he mean in Mark 16 where, when he said, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned? Absolutely. Um, is baptism mandatory for salvation? Well, boy. 30 seconds to answer deep theological questions. 30 seconds, yeah. <laughs> well, no, take your time, take your time. No, no it's, a, it's a very very serious question for a lot of people. It, it's very serious, and it's, it's interesting where I am, because um, you know, I believe you're in Florida. But here in the Midwest, um, there's, there's a great deal of, of infant baptism in and, and various denominations. And so people that leave those denominations and come to our church, which is, which is an evangelical church, and we practice, we practice believer's baptism, adult baptism. Uh, sometimes they'll say, well, you know, I, I, I love the Lord, I, I believe I'm saved, I have great assurance of my salvation, do I need to get baptized again? And yeah, that's a hard question to answer. Mm-hmm. Um, and I say that because I've, I've read a lot, and I've, I've sought the wise counsel of godly men, and it's hard to get a real definitive answer, you know, when you have someone like that. But I, I tell them, look, all I know is Jesus said, believe, repent, and get baptized. In the early church, baptism happened in very close proximity to a profession of faith. So don't wait. Get baptized. Be obedient. I, I asked I ask an Orthodox priest one time about about infant baptism, and, and what he said to me was, he said, you evangelicals wait until the children grow up and you give them the option to be baptized. He said, we Orthodox, we baptize them right away, and when they grow up, they have to opt out. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and and I know like with the, the Roman Catholic Church, um, but I've never heard it explained that way, you know, he yeah, just, because they've got to make a conscious decision to get out. I don't even know what to say to that. Uh, you know, th- there's the view of ex opere operatum, uh, which means by the operation performed, or by the operation thereof, you know, where you take a child, you infuse grace into them through baptism, and then they they take hold of other means of grace as they grow to work for justification. And that that's an inverted gospel. Um, so in terms of here at my church, at an evangelical church, we practice believer's baptism, and it... 
uh, and many a lot of our Baptist brothers, by definition, um, baptism is required to join the church. Um, and a lot of our Baptist brothers, who we're very, very close to theologically and, and have a lot of partnerships with them, um, they will counsel a believer quite a bit before baptism to drive the importance of what this is and the commitments and to, and to catechize them, essentially. And we do much the same here. Um, and, and a lot of that is because of what we began talking about in the very beginning is so much um, kind of convoluted or truncated gospel preaching is, okay, do you, you came from us from another church or you moved here from a, a different community, uh, and, and here we are as the church trying to basically use the authority that Christ has given us to stamp your passport to see if you're a citizen of the kingdom or not. And uh, y- you need to be baptized, you need to be obedient to these things. Well, I got baptized ten years ago. Okay, well, what were the circumstances? <laughs> you know, <laughs> But baptism should be held uh, very yes. high. The, the, Absolutely. Early, the early church would not even permit non-baptized people to even see with their eyes the Holy Communion. They would have to leave the service if they were not baptized. They couldn't even watch baptized Christians partake of communion. That's that's how stringent it was. And, uh, you know, and they also required them to uh, verbally renounce the works of the devil. They, they mm. you know, they were they were they were required to say with their mouth that they no longer serve Satan. And uh, so there's a lot of things that, you know, over the years we've lost. We've lost the reverence and the significance of baptism. Well, listen, I wish we had another hour to go with uh, with you because we've just barely gotten started. Um, the book is The Gospel of Our Grandfathers, Preserving the Good News for Future Generations. The author is J.A. White. And, and again, this is, a, this is a fantastic, easy to read, easy to understand basic theology book. If you just want to know the basic fundamentals of the Christian faith, whether you've been serving the Lord for a long, long time, or you're a brand new Christian, or you just... You're listening to True News, and you're just you're kind of playing around the edge, wondering, do you want to become a Christian? Get this book, and it will really help you understand what the Christian faith is all about. Again, the gospel of our grandfathers, Pastor J. A- Aaron White. Pastor White, thank you so much. Appreciate you spending time with us today. Yes, yeah, sir. The pleasure is mine. Thank you so much. Well, last night before uh, going to sleep, I was reading from uh, Martin Luther's Catechism, on the uh, nature of baptism. And it says, uh, what is baptism? Luther said, baptism is not just plain water, but it is the water included in God's command and combined with God's word. What benefits does baptism give? It works forgiveness of sins, rescues from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe this. As the words and the promises of God declare, how can water do such great things. Certainly not just water, but the Word of God in and with the water does these things, along with the faith which trusts this Word of God in the water. For without God's Word, the water is plain water and no baptism. But with the Word of God, it is a baptism that is a life-giving water, rich in grace, and a washing of the new birth in the Holy Spirit, As St. Paul says in Titus chapter 3, He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. My friend, if you've not been born again and baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, by all means, do it and do it soon.